Welcome to Tomorrow Today, where we take an inside look at how weather is impacting organizations around the world and the unique ways they're combating the impact. Brought to you by Tomorrow.io, the world's leading weather intelligence and climate adaptation platform. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Ruth Vella, and I'm super excited to be speaking today um, with a great trio from Tomorrow.io. Uh, Jim Carswell, Joe Munchak, and Cole Swain are here today to talk about how space-backed weather intelligence will revolutionize hurricane forecasting. It's a really interesting topic, and I'm really excited to learn more. Um, Cole, Joe, Jim, can you each introduce yourselves and maybe briefly tell us a little bit about your roles here at Tomorrow.io? My name is Joe Munchak. I'm a principal atmospheric data scientist here at Tomorrow.io, and I specialize in bringing in our satellite data and bringing it into our weather platform so it can help people make decisions based on the unique data that we're getting from our satellites. Hey, everybody. My name is Cole Swain. I manage our product team and where we're going strategically. Thanks for having us, Ruth. Uh, looking forward to the chat. I've spent my career uh, working to advance our ability to observe uh, weather and climate, uh, particularly uh, building, designing and building uh, ground-based, airborne, and, and uh, satellite-based uh, radar systems and radiometers. Uh, I've been really fortunate. Uh, I, I, I started off my career working with NASA and NOAA, and I was able to spend the first 15 years of my career uh, flying on hurricane hunting aircraft. Uh, and uh, not only uh, did uh, I really uh, learn a lot and make impacts with, uh, with uh, being able to develop next generation radar systems, um, but I really got to experience and see uh, what these storms are all about and, and uh, really appreciated uh, their, uh, their strength and, and, uh, and motivated me a lot um, to continue in this field. Uh, to, to uh, you know, hopefully make a big difference uh, for our communities that are, are impacted by the, these storms. Uh, at Tomorrow I.O., <laughs> I'm one of the white hairs or the older folks uh, at, at here. Uh, in, uh, I play a central role in space in, uh, 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 in sensors group with uh, developing the architecture. Uh, for our uh, radar systems, uh, both for space, but also on the airborne uh, campaigns. Uh, we're deploying our, our instruments on, on those hurricane hunting aircraft. Uh, and uh, another role, it, too, is using my experience and working with the teams that uh, support the development uh, of these systems as, as uh, we, we uh, look to go to space with them. Awesome. Um, so thanks so much for that background. Uh, I think we can just dive right in with some big questions. Um, we're talking about hurricane forecasting today. Um, Joe, do you want to maybe kick us off? Can you explain to us why hurricanes are so hard to predict? What is the state of hurricane forecasting right now? Yeah, so hurricanes are some of the most intense storms on earth. Um, they pack quite a bit of rain and wind and can cause some of the, the highest damage totals and, um, and threaten life as well, um, where, wherever they hit. And what makes hurricanes unique is their small scale relative to the really big weather systems that um, we're used to predicting and how they can change in intensity very rapidly. So over the past several decades, as we've gotten better at predicting the weather in general, we've gotten better at predicting where the hurricanes will go and, and where they will track. Um, the forecasting of the intensity has lagged behind, although some improvements have been made. Um, we understand it better but it's still a matter of getting good enough observations to make those forecasts. Yeah. So do just build off of uh, what Joe was saying, uh, the observations are getting more observations today uh, and in the future are critical to really improve uh, the models. Uh, but also the observations uh, are used by the hurricane specialists, the forecasters in real time. And they're looking at all these different models. Everybody's heard of spaghetti models and, and all of that. And what the observations do is it allows them to evaluate what models are, are doing best in real time. And when it comes to it, the, the warnings that they issue um, really need to uh, be validated um, by the observations to have the confidence. And so the more observations we get, uh, the, uh, as the models are developing and improving, uh, the forecasters are going to have the tools that they need 
uh, to make the best uh, warning or forecast in the short term uh, that they need. Yeah, I can see how like complex factors would make forecasting challenging. Um, so as we know, um, here at Tomorrow, we are planning to launch a constellation of satellites. How do you envision the future of hurricane forecasting evolving once we have space data from those satellites um, as an integral part of the process? Yeah, so our satellites are unique in a couple of ways. They are really coming in, t- in with two different types of instruments. One is a weather radar. And weather radar is a really great tool for understanding hurricanes because it scans the storm in three dimensions. We know how heavy the rain will be. We know where that rain's located and how it's organized within the storm. And really rainfall is the key to hurricane intensification. All of the energy that hurricanes use to grow and drive those winds ultimately comes from the formation of rain, from clouds and the evaporation of moisture from the ocean surface. So these are really critical instruments. And right now there's really only radar data available um, once you get within a few hundred miles of the coastline. With our satellite radars, we'll be able to monitor these storms as they form far out in the ocean. Now, the other type of satellite we're going to have is called a microwave sounder. And that type of satellite measures emissions from the earth in the microwave spectrum, which is the same spectrum that weather radars operate at, except instead of sending out a signal, it's just listening um, to the natural signals emitted from the earth. And these are related to the temperature and water vapor of the atmosphere. And with hurricanes specifically, the temperature in the eye is very stru- closely related to its intensity. And so by having these measurements much more frequently than we can currently get them, we'll be able to monitor the intensification of storms um, on much shorter time scales and catch those rapid intensification events. Joe, can you talk a little bit about how it's going to allow us also to capture the swath size of these storms so that we'll be able to understand more about the storm from a spatial standpoint and how the structure of these storms are influential to uh, how we understand the rapid intensification? Yeah, it's a great question. So these satellites will measure over um, several hundred miles, and in the case of the sounders, over a thousand miles um, underneath the satellite. And so that's going to give us a really big picture view of the storm and its structure. And it's not just going to be pinpointed to just near the eye or near one of the rain bands. And it's really that overall structure that's um, really critical to determining the intensity change. If the rain is falling, if all the heavy rain is concentrated near the storm center, that's a sign that a storm is poised to intensify. If the rain is being pushed to one side um, and, and not located near the center, then that, that's a, a signal that the storm is either not intensifying or weakening. That's really interesting. Thank you, guys. Um, So earlier this month, we saw Hurricane Otis hit Mexico. Can Joe, can you maybe explain what a rapidly intensifying storm is, really? So a rapidly intensifying storm, if you look back at the academic papers that that define this, it was an increase in the wind speed of 30 knots over 24 hours. And that definition was made back in the early 2000s, about 20 years ago. So that's kind of a run in the mill intensification right now. What we saw with Hurricane Otis was an intensification of, I want to say nearly 90 miles per hour over a 12 hour time period. So it's, it's almost a factor of 10 when you convert that to the uh, same 24 hour period. So it was really off the scale. And I think it was maybe only exceeded by one other storm in the modern records. So that's obviously a really serious, um, event with huge implications because that storm ended up hitting Acapulco, Mexico, uh, less than a day after it went through that rapid intensification. So it literally went from a tropical storm with 70 mile per hour winds to a category five hurricane hitting land in less than 24 hours. Is there more to why these storms are occurring more frequently right now? Well, the intensity of a storm is ultimately driven by how warm the ocean water is. And we know that the ocean waters are getting warmer with climate change. So it stands to reason that we'll see more of these rapid intensification events. Um, And the records that we have, um, to the extent that we have good records, of course, only in the Atlantic Ocean do we fly hurricanes in to measure the intensity accurately. Everything else is based on these satellite estimates and the satellite record, um, as we always get new technology up, it keeps improving. So it's hard to say for certain what the trend is, but where we do have good data, like the Atlantic Ocean, it does seem like there's a trend towards more frequent rapid intensification events. Um, can you guys talk a little bit about why space data would, would be a game changer in these kinds of situations in predicting these types of hurricanes? Yeah, so the space data is, is really critical for monitoring hurricanes because 
like I said, they, they form out over the ocean far from land. And we really um, don't have many other ways of getting data out there. There's um, ships will tend to avoid a storm once they know it's there, of course. Uh, planes fly into them only in the Atlantic Ocean, where, where the National Hurricane Center and the National Weather Service have the resources to perform those flights. Everywhere else, we're totally reliant on satellite data to, to provide early warnings of these storms forming. And to think about that, something Joe just said there, uh, the United States are the only ones that are flying out these missions, right? So there's a tremendous amount of area around the world that we're not observing with the instruments that these hurricane hunters are flying into. And keep in mind, they only do it when there's a hurricane that is threatening the coastlines that is worthwhile, the operation, as I'm sure Jim will elaborate on. Um, but it's a logistical operation around timing and placement. And when these hurricane hunters are in the storm, uh, it's a bit of a stroke of luck, of course. And I'm not one who can speak through experience. Jim has flown over 100 of these missions. Uh, but you do these hourly cross-section scans as you go back and forth in pursuit of compiling an understanding of what's going on with that storm holistically. But that gets offset by every hour that you go back and forth and you're pointing the instrument that you're using to scan in a particular area that you have to know where to point it towards. And so when you think about the level of fidelity of information we're able to gain today, given the kind of current challenges with satellites that are up, take for example, the current radar that's up there today, only revolves around the world at a frequency uh, much less than what our constellation ex to be, expects to be able to provide. We're not capturing these events when they're occurring in areas that we don't care about. And so with a lot of what Joe's team is working on with the machine learning techniques that we deploy here at Tomorrow, it allows us or will allow us to be able to create a pulse or a story on so many other observations of how they evolve every hour by scanning their journey and how they progress and then, Joe, something you had taught me not so long ago, also the aspects of the weather and both the atmosphere and the maritime side of things and what parameters or situations are causing the journey and life cycle of these storms to change. And so the training set of the availability of data that we can gain by scanning more larger areas and scanning full storms with a lot of what Joe has just mentioned more often allows us to really exponentially compound our understanding of these storms and therefore what causes these escalations. Joe, would you say that's a fair way of explaining it? Yeah, I think so. There's uh, a lot of different different tools at our disposal from the aircraft to the satellites and everything in between. Uh, one thing I want to mention, though, is that you mentioned the current satellite situation. So right now, um, for hurricane monitoring, we have geostationary satellites. These are the workhorses um, that have been put up by NOAA and the European uh, Meteorological Satellite Agency and uh, J Japanese Meteorological Agency. They all operate these geostationary satellites that take pictures of the Earth every 10 or 15 minutes. But these satellites really only see the cloud top, and that can tell us where a hurricane is. It can tell us um, roughly its intensity once the eye clears out, but that can take some time to happen as the storm's intensifying. So we need these other tools like these microwave sounders and like the radar, um, which you mentioned. So right now for Hurricane Otis, uh, there were only three microwave sounder overpasses during that 12 hour rapid intensification period. And there was only one radar overpass from the NASA GPM core observatory. And that was a lucky overpass. Normally that flies over an area every two or three days. And they just happened to get it towards the beginning of that rapid intensification window. So with the Tomorrow I.O. constellation, we'll have much, much more frequent revisit with, with less than an hour gaps um, between data for coming from our satellite constellation. This stuff really math shows it, Joe, from the analysis that we did a few days after. It looked like we would have had 13 additional scans during the first eight hour period of escalation, which, I mean, that's tremendous data to be able to observe the changing nature of these storms every hour, especially when you're scanning such a large picture of it so you can understand the profile. Because Joe, the, the imagery that you had showed me, I, I'll, I'll never forget it, uh, how quickly, to your point about the symmetry, how quickly you can see from the scans that it's really escalating into something that's very symmetrical and you can see it intensifying visually. But the images that you had shared with me were so far apart around when the scans were able to happen. And so those extra 13 are just instrumental to observe 
the beginning innings of when that's starting to change. Yeah, that's right. There were there were some data gaps in there of up to three hours. And if that doesn't sound like much, remember this but that the rate this storm was intensifying, that could be a two category change in the hurricane intensity that was totally missed by not having the re- really frequent overpasses. And yeah, it's it's like taking a few still pictures and being able to turn it into a real movie that you can use to understand how that structure is changing in real time. And keep in mind, most of the people uh, weren't really given any notice. The storm hit in the middle of the night. And so they went to bed thinking that it was just going to be a storm rolling through. And they woke up to, which many of the people watching this, I'm sure you've seen the imagery, the damage that happened. This, this Imagine waking up to that, right? And so even an hour earlier of notice, even six hours earlier of notice, before you go to bed so that you can make sure that you're taking care of the people that you're dependent on or reverse, I mean, just giving that advance notice for preparation of people, it's invaluable. Yeah, absolutely. Six oh, yeah. six hours of extra notice, 12 hours of extra notice could make a huge deal in terms of protecting life and property in a situation like this. You know, what what Joe was saying uh, with the ability to observe these storms as they're rapidly intensifying is is really hard. Um, and, to, and what we really want to be able to do is sort of get a 3D uh, observations. So uh, the GO satellites, awesome, and really helping us uh, see what's going on. Uh, But what our constellation will be able to do is peer through the clouds and really give the full three-dimensional, which will aid uh, in the um, in the intensity uh, forecasting or understanding. And and to kind of bring this home, to give an example, um, I you know I spent over a decade flying on hurricane hunters through the through the storms directly. And it's not, sometimes we would fly as low as 1,500 feet, but 1,500 feet, 5,000 feet, 10,000 feet. And we'd go out there with a storm and we fly uh, directly through, we'll make a north to south leg, say, directly through the storm. And when we got through the whole thing, we would uh, make an east-west and then a west-east. And, and uh, the, these were called figure fours. What we were doing with the aircraft uh, was really getting that high uh, resolution in uh, observations uh, of what's happening under the clouds. Uh, but the challenge, even with these aircraft, is first, you have to be in the right place at the right time. And second, it, it takes over an hour to pass through. So as an example, when I was flying through hurricanes, there's Hurricane Brett, and it was heading towards Texas. Didn't didn't seem like a big deal. It was a category one, two, when we, when we left Tampa uh, in the hurricane hunting aircraft and we got across uh, the Gulf and, and we started flying in it. Well, by the time we left that storm, it was almost a category five. So the mission was probably eight, eight hours the whole time. We're in the storm for maybe uh, five to six hours. But every leg we went through, the storm was getting stronger and stronger. The point being, if we weren't there at that time, we would have missed that. And that was critical information going back to the hurricane specialists to really change the warnings and and so that people had time to prepare. What our constellation is going to be able to do is not the same resolution uh, as the aircraft, but it's going to give that three-dimensional view over the whole area on an hourly basis. That's huge. And it can be utilized to help better use the aircraft. The aircraft don't have to fly over the whole area. We can deploy those or other resources uh, in areas where we can get additional information. So it's the, the collection of all that that is gonna be a game changer for us. Yeah, yeah, it was with the passive microwave observations, uh, what we're able to do, although it's not a radar and doesn't truly uh, profile, uh, you can derive by using multiple different frequencies uh information about the temperature uh uh through in the humidity uh through the whole storm vertically and uh that that is giving us not just here here's where we envision or we see the storm but maybe maybe the eye is slightly offset from what's happening at the clouds you'll get that picture and of course those parameters temperature in in humidity water content water vapor uh, are the key aspects to really understanding uh, how the storm is going to intensify or how it's going to uh, 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 de-intensify, de- I guess. 
Can you tell me a little bit about the value of passive microwave observations from space? Like, I know we talk a lot about the radar, but what is the value that our microwave sounders will drive? Yeah, so I touched a little bit on passive microwave observations earlier, but but just to recap, the idea is that these instruments are sensitive to what's going on underneath the top of the cloud. So you've got your traditional geostationary images, the, the cameras that would show you what you would see with your own eyes. You're really just seeing the cloud top there. With the microwave, they're longer wavelengths, so they interact with bigger particles. So at the top of clouds, the ice particles are really small. Um, and as you get deeper into the clouds where you have actual precipitation falling, that's where the microwave has a signal that it can see. So we see the structure of the rain bands underneath the cloud top so we can see the eye wall forming before it clears out. And that can give us six to 12 hours advance notice of intensification. I mentioned that we can see the temperature and the water vapor structure with these storms, which also give clues as to the intensity. And all this data can go into our forecast models as they, if they have more precise estimates of the moisture available to a storm, then they can calculate the rainfall and how that will uh, increase the intensity with greater accuracy. So it's really important to feed this into our forecast models as well. Just to layer on top of it, right, and to use a corny analogy, it's, it's really the only thing that I can think of on the fly here. Imagine breaking your arm, right, and then getting an x-ray on it the first day. But then every day you get an x-ray or every hour you get an x-ray and imagine connecting all of those x-rays together and you'd see the progression of your arm healing right today and you'd be able to understand when you're getting healthier how it's where you're at in your state today imagine you're only getting an x-ray you're not even getting an, a full x-ray of your arm you're getting a piece of an x-ray you're getting a slice of an x-ray and you're not even getting it daily in this situation. Now, I can't imagine anybody would want to get an x-ray every day, but it's for kind of an analog of understanding what that would give you an understanding of your healing rate. Uh, together with, imagine you're only given a few pixels of that x-ray today. So I think there could have been a better analogy, but I hope it sends the picture. That's a good way. Yeah, to no, you make a good point. It's, it's all about the time scale involved, right? We need to monitor the process on the relevant time scale. Right now, like with, with your arm healing, the time scale might be every few weeks. So you only need an x-ray checkup every few weeks. But with the hurricane intensifying, it's every few hours, but we're only getting that scan every few days. And so there's a mismatch there. It's a great way to put it. Cole, you started to hit on this a little earlier, but how do we foresee space, space data enhanced forecasts influencing public safety, evacuation plans, and like overall preparedness, not just against, again, not just against hurricanes, but against any kind of weather. This is a really hard problem for the world, agnostic to our ability to be precise and generate incredibly accurate predictions. And there are a lot smarter people in this world focusing on this problem uh, because it is a really big one. And when you think of what somebody that receives, let's take, for instance, a notification that a hurricane or a tsunami or any significant event is coming their way, and that actually doesn't materialize, it doesn't foster, that person loses faith in that alert the next time they get it. And it's the reason why many of us receive notifications at points that might result in us doing nothing in response to it, because it's hard to get this right. And so when we think about how do we create confidence in ways that we can better educate people in these cities that need to make really hard decisions because this is an expensive process to spin up around positioning resources for people to have safety or, or a place to kind of go to. It has everything to do with our ability to observe the situation and provide real-time updates as fast as possible to be able to influence our ability to predict it and provide confidence on those predictions. And so our expectation is, Yes, we're going to be providing very high resolution forecasting for a wide range of parameters like we already do today for so many of our customers. But when it comes to these big events, the observations are instrumental and we're, we're partnering with many of the different agencies that are spending such a large amount of time getting these predictions right. And that's where on the topic of today, the constellation can contribute tremendously for the same reasons that we described with Hurricane Otis fostering so quickly Earlier notice gives everybody an advantage. But I say, and I begin with that challenge that so many people have around early warning systems and be able to deliver that information accurately. 
That's why we have invested in space, because the only way to improve accuracy is to be able to improve the way that you observe and train over time, over more area, with more scenarios to learn from. And that's what we're doing. That's the only way. Yeah. So uh, to touch upon what uh, Cole was saying in, in a lot of the conversation that's already happened, uh, the uh, one problem with hurricanes is crying wolf, as I think he was saying. Uh, and the uh, forecasters uh, that are on the on the on the floor making these decisions in real time know that lives are, are going to be impacted. Um, and without the observations, they have to err on the safe side. So often, uh, because of uncertainty, uh, they have to issue warnings over larger areas because if it went that way and people weren't prepared, lives are going to be lost. The observations that we're going to be able to provide will give the forecasters uh, the confidence that uh, that they can narrow potentially, that's the goal at least, narrow those forecasts or those warning areas. Um, I remember back in 1990s when I was flying in hurricanes, uh, we used to say every mile of coastline that was put under warning cost a million dollars in the United States for preparation, not for the, the hit, but for preparation. Today, I can't imagine what that number is. Um, the other aspect, too, I think that is really critical, we're talking about making observations on a global basis, on an hourly basis. They're, it's not the same resolution as the aircraft or your weather radar that's at home uh, in your ho home area, but it's hourly over the whole globe uh, in the areas where all these storms are forming. So what does this buy us? One, we're going to see storms that we haven't documented. Uh, we're going to start seeing these things over and over. We're going to be able to trace their whole life cycle, as, as Cole was explaining. And from that, the researchers uh, and the policymakers are going to start learning a lot better. Um, what's the criteria for these to form? But also, what's the statistics? How often do these happen? This region, I'm seeing this event, how intense it can be. This is going to uh, provide really important information to communities as our climate is changing to begin understanding how they need to prepare. What's the threat? Uh, because every dollar, uh, communities don't have a lot of money. They need to spend their uh, money wisely. Our constellation is going to build an enormous data set that's going to really help the, even the local communities uh, make those decisions and use their money the best way they can. What can, like in the meantime, before we have satellite data available, what can meteorologists and communities do to better prepare for rapidly intensifying storms or just any kind of weather event right now? Yeah, so it's it's pretty clear. Pay attention to the National Hurricane Center if you're in their area of responsibility. They are the experts. Um, they have more experience than anyone else, and they've shown year after year improvements in forecasting the track and intensity of these storms and have a track record that's second to none. And, um, and they have the responsibility to issue, issue the warnings um, over the United States and the Atlantic Basin. Yeah, I, I mean, every year, uh, at least in the United States, we, we have NOAA really putting out a campaign. Uh, and I think it really just comes to all of us educating ourselves better. Uh, we got to realize that weather is getting more intense. Um, I've seen is 60... 100 foot waves just bulldozed over by the wind as we're flying through the hurricanes. It's, you know, the power is amazing. So uh, we we need to do simple things, clear our lawns, <laughs> of, you know, and, and, and believe that that when you're ish, given a, a warning that don't try to don't try to buckle down and, and try to sit through it. Um, if it's really going to be intense or they think it's going to be uh listen and evacuate or or at least do all the preparations that that you're being asked of uh that that's critical we all need to do our part awesome well this has been a super enlightening look at innovation in hurricane forecasting and weather in general thank you so much jim joe cole for lending your expertise it's really exciting to see what tomorrow.io is doing to support forecasting um thank you <laughs>